setting the bar bowling. Uh, it's it's time now to have the formal procession of the event. Uh, okay. I would start. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, who is the master of the day of judgment. Uh, the very first, I want to extend my words of appreciation, uh, my words of thanks, and my sheer acknowledgement uh, to all the distinguished participants. Uh, they have a connectivity on this uh, global forum, and I would say for a very very important cause. The cause that we have, that is the theme of the event. We are going through this uh, systemic risk right now. On the one side, we could face uh, there is the health emergency is there, but on the other side, we have to look into that how we are going to shape the financial world of the of of all the economies of the world, where we can find uh, where we can provide the more the financially conducive environment, where we can provide a more uh, the financial. The synergy uh, through these inter uh, international uh, coordinations as well. So, from this perspective, so once again, by the words of thanks to all of you. So, let's start with the the recitation of the Holy Quran. And uh, for this, I would request to one of our PhD candidates, Mr. Sitan Fida, to please uh, fascinate our participants uh, with the beautiful verses of the Holy Quran. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Kul a'uzu bi rabbin nas Malikin nas Ilahin nas Min sharril waswasil hannas Allazi yuvas visu fi sudurin nas Minal jinnati wan nas Sadaqallah ulazim Jazakallah Jazakallah Okay, the dis uh, distinguished participants and our global panelists from the Oman and from Malaysia uh, I would say uh, it's a big moment for everyone that we are holding a thoughtfulness on one of that the area of significance that is uh, the need of time for any, for every individual for every startup for looking into the serious uh, there is a wave of bankruptcies is going on so it becomes important that through this forum we can invite a collective thought which could take the form of uh, the strong recommendations which can foster uh, the way forward of the the financial world of the the whole universe. So, from this perspective, uh, the firstly, I would request to the dean of faculty, Dr. Shamsi, uh, sir, thanks for taking your time out, and we request you uh, to please formally open the procession of the session with your uh, the sense of the financial discourse. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Navi. Uh, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. The honourable. International panelist, Professor Dr. Suresh Ramakrishnan from University of Technology, Malaysia, Professor Dr. Ahmad Raza Bilal from Sohar University, Oman, the respectable corporate financial experts, academicians, and my dear students. Assalamu alaikum. It's indeed great pleasure and honor for me to be the part of this galaxy. I am using the word galaxy because I believe you all are shining stars of your galaxy, the global financial sector. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how many ladies are there. COVID-19 is an accident which is sudden and deadly. It has halted almost everything, including lives of individuals and governments. We all are in numb situation. To come back to life, we have to strive and bounce back to survive and sustain. Finance is like lifeblood. As important of importance of blood is in human body, as important is finance for economy. To avoid this numb situation, we have to revitalize our financial aspects to survive and sustain. Ladies and gentlemen, 
financial stability is needed for both individuals and governments. Individuals are facing problems in COVID-19 because of lockdown. Businessmen are unable to do businesses and borrowers are unable to pay back their monthly installments. People are losing jobs and it causing unemployment. To avoid unemployment, government is easing the lockdown, which is causing even higher rate of pandemic. People generally are unable to make their livings possible. Because of non-business activities, social problems are emerging across the world. Governments on one side, keeping people restrained in their homes by maintaining lockdown, protect the lives of masses. On the other hand, governance itself is becoming important. It means not only general administration, but financial governance as well. In this regard, role of central banks are important by revising monetary policies of the countries. Second, fiscal policies of government to manage taxes. Banks and the appropriate use of technology by facilitating the routine transactions and banking operations are another challenge, particularly country like Pakistan. This fintech is not only becoming pivotal in COVID-19, but to increase outreach of banking in rural parts of the country. Investors play a very important role in success and sustainability of any country. In COVID-19, the investors' confidence is shattered. This is responsibility of government generally and financial sector of country particularly to regain the confidence of investors. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said, finance is like life pillar for human body. The clotting or malfunctioning of blood causes problems, but in some cases causes death. This exactly happens with finance in a country. If it starts malfunctioning, it causes problems like instability of every kind and in every walk of life. To cure the country, financial stability is must. And this exactly the point of discussion of this international symposium. I hope we together will have sound recommendations for effective policy execution to protect not only one country, but generally the entire world. Thank you very much. With this, I hand over to Dr. Naveed again. Uh, Dr. Shamsi, thank you once again uh, for your uh, very seminal thoughts and setting the stage for the the, the, uh, the overall discussions, uh, discourse, uh, engaging this important cause. So if I look into uh, my if I look into my consistency with the strand of discussions we have today. So the first thought uh, that comes very close to how we are going to unleash your governance model. We have to provide a financial resilience. Uh, we have to provide a liquidity, and we have to give a level of uh, the confidence to our uh, investor sentiments. So it becomes important that we have to unleash our governance system. So we have the the presence of Dr. Suresh from Malaysia, uh, since he is one of the expert on corporate governance. So sir, it would be worth listening from you. So what could be the new corp of financial governance dialogues going, uh, going through this unleashed environment, how we are going to comply with this existing pandemic and how we are going to look into the way forward that we have. And finally, it would be also important if we could have the lessons that we have learned from the previous uh, uh, systemic risk in the form of GFC crisis uh, 2007 eight. So sir, Dr. Suresh, it's uh, over to you. Yeah, um, good evening to everyone. Huh? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we have, um, uh, I think corporate governance is, is becoming a, a very critical issue. It's not now, actually, if you see that uh, 
even from the Asian financial crisis, uh, since I'm from Malaysia, always when I go to my lecture, I always talk about this. Uh, Malaysia learned a great lesson. Eh? Malaysia basically uh, learned a great lesson. Uh, in 1997, Asian financial crisis, it was a big tsunami, I would say. And one of the main issue was a very weak corporate governance. I always tell to my students why it happens. First of all, uh, of course, in terms of the procedures and so forth, but they were so small. I'm talking about like in terms of the banking sector, you know. Now, surprisingly, we have only, you know, from 50 plus commercial banks, now we have, we end up with eight commercial banks. So just imagine the size of the bank previously in 97, 98. So they, they could not survive, but just because of the support of the government, you know, the banks just go on and till now we can see after a great merger and acquisition as a size, so you can see that end of the day, they survived. And that was a very good uh, exercise, I would say. So when this 2007, 2008, the global financial crisis hit Malaysia, I'm st just starting from Malaysia point of view, uh, we were not that badly affected. If you compare to other countries, we were not that bad. We were affected, but not that badly affected because you learned the lesson actually in 97 and 98. So it is, you know, in terms of each and every aspects, you know, in, in the banking uh, procedures. And I think we have also have an expert on banks later. Uh, uh, Dr. Ahmad will explain to us on that part. So now it is like after another 10 years, it's more than 10 years, and we didn't expect that. Uh, we didn't expect that, you know, um, what do you call it, um, this specific, uh, pandemic. We were thinking some other crisis, financial crisis will come into the country or in the globe. But finally, it was a different way of coming in. It was a disease. The disease came in and it collapsed the whole thing. Uh, but again, when, when we go through the scenario of um, across countries, uh, two days ago, I had a very good discussion with uh, Professor Richard. Uh, from Harvard Business School. For your information, I'm from Azman Hashim International Business School. And Professor uh, Richard Vitor is basically one of our council members on uh, our faculty. And he, saw, he basically sits in our, in, uh, in our council, uh, faculty council, and he becomes one of our adjunct professor. So when we had a very good discussion with him two days ago, two, three days ago online, we had an online discussion, and we could see that uh, basically uh, what we can see, uh, I'm just talking the governance from the banking point of view. Later on, I'll come back to the uh, firms, uh, individual firms and so forth. I don't know, Dr. Navid, are you asking me from the banking perspective governance or from the firm's perspective? Uh, Dr. Srish, uh, from the perspective of the crisis, uh, if we uh, have a quick, the bird's eye view on the, on the difference between these two crises, the during GFC 7-8, uh, we could see it was a very serious uh, the financial distress that is being faced by the banking sector itself but the COVID 19 is basically the health have, uh, emergency that have systemically a spillover impact on all the economic side social and the financial side of the world but uh, the hope the hope is there that your banking sector is still alive your banking sector is still solvent so from that perspective if you think we could have some lesson learned from the past these lesson learned they could be uh, very instrumental to deal with these crises we are facing now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Navi. Yeah, it, it's, you are right. You are right. Actually, that's what I'm telling you. Uh, from 97, 98, we learned lesson. And then from 2000, 2008, again, we learned lesson. You know, all this, uh, you know, all this experience actually makes us very strong fundamentally. But my, my thinking is that, yeah, we are strong. We are strong. As you say that we are solvent, we are strong. But again, we have to see what is the direction because this is a very unique kind of risk that came in into the economy and it collapsed the overall economy. Yes, I do agree. Certain sectors have a positive impact. Certain sectors have a negative impact. But generally, if you come back to the statistics, it says that the developed country is going to face a very big issue okay, in terms of their growth, whereby they're going to drop by 6%. And uh, uh, for the emerging and also for the developing countries around 3%, you just imagine it's the other way around. The developed is going to really hit. And you know, all the giant countries are going to be hit. So now looking back, in terms of the size of the bank now, 
right? I know that you are saying that we are strong, we are solvent, we are ready, but looking into the scenario currently is that it's a lockdown where everybody has to be at home. So then you have to find another mechanism. So here, the governance has to be changed. You can't be using the same governance in order to, to maintain, to, to continue into the market. Later on, I think when um, Dr. Ahmad starts to talk about uh, the digitalization, then we can talk about that, FinTech and so forth. So looking from the bank perspective, even the bank itself, even though they are strong, they have learned lesson. In Malaysia have learned lesson twice. Other countries have learned lesson, lesson from the global. But again, the, the fundamental problem here is a little bit different. You must understand that the economy is totally affected. You know, nothing is going on. It's quite slow, you know. And even, let's say, for example, the bank wants to give loan. They have to be very careful, knowing that certain sectors are very risky. So again, they're going to charge them high interest, for example, because the, the bank has to also always cover up. They have to have a safe zone. So how do this firm is going to survive? That's another question, right? And coming back to the firm sustainability, I'm always, I always look at from the firm perspective in terms of the firm sustainability, how resilient they are. Are they really ready? Do they can go on with that? So if let's say for those negatively impacted sectors, obviously this kind of firm is going to struggle a lot. The large firm from the beginning, they can move some or other, so-called sustainable, but in the long run, it'll be again a big issue. But just imagine about the SMEs, they are also going to be really affected. So then later on, we have to look into how do government is going to, you know, government is trying to stimulate the economy. But again, the government can't be continuously doing that. You know, we, we, are, we are going to see that the unemployment rate is going to increase. The inflation is going to increase. And you can't be increasing the tax when there is no revenue. And then if revenue doesn't come into the country, then how country is going to do the government spending? So it's all interrelated. So starting from the banking governance and going back to the firm's governance and finally the government governments, governance, all the three parts of the governance should play a very major role. Uh, you know, so from the firm sustainability uh, perspective, they are going to really face a big issue. Because as I told you that, again, but FinTech, FinTech at the moment, if you see, even though we are saying that FinTech is really moving up fast, but initially they also been affected because end of the day is all talking about economy activity. So if the economy activity is slowed down, so everything is slowed down, something like a main switch. If the main switch is gone, the rest of the switches is gone. So then we have to look into the multiplier effects. So look into the sustainable, the governance part. So that's the that's reason I'm starting from the firm's uh, governance, the firm sustainability or the firm's corporate governance, right? Because look into how they are going to go about it. Let's go into the capital market. If you see the stock market is also, you know, have, having a very high volatility, right? On the other side, on the debt market, you can see the spread is getting bigger. So then when, for example, the bond spread is getting higher, so what's going to happen at the end of the day, the credit rating of the bond is going to go down. So then this will create risk. So investors will be leaving. They don't want to invest in the company anymore. So all these things are creating a big issue for those company. And from the bank perspective, why I'm saying that the bank has to come up with a different corporate governance is looking into how to settle this issue when people are going to work from home and no one's going to wander around in the town and you're not going to have your premise at the roadside, the banks is going to have problem because you know, so you have to change your entire mechanism. So now what I'm trying to, uh, I just want to contribute too much, I'll come back later because I feel that there are some other panelists there. What my stand is here is that we have to look into these three governance, that is the bank governance, the firm's governance, and the government governance. But I would like to focus more on the banking sector because they are a very important sector to, to make sure the economy keep on moving, right? So how the bank is going to react on that? What is the main thing they should look into it? That is what they're trying to say that we have to go into the era of digitalization.
right? So the bank has to move towards that, uh, that directions. So some or other, we can find a better way. But later I'll come back on the FinTech issue. Thank you, Dr. Nareen. Okay, thank you, Dr. Suresh. Uh, exactly the sustainability uh, through uh, good governance we have in the, the banking sector that is more important. Uh, before I would move towards uh, the significance of the this the digital landscape, I just want to add one thing. Uh, the previous experiences that we have, whenever we are facing the issue of the liquidity, whenever we have the issue of the solvency of the financial system, so then there is a concept of the impairment of the market. So I just want to have one note, a quick note from your side, how we are going to have the impairment of the market because this systemic risk, uh, risk is still going on. Still, we, we are uncertain about the future. So this risk is highly important from the perspective of it's the future itself because we cannot still in a position that we can decide what is the finally the devastating impact that we have recorded. So we are just uh, in transition phase. So this transition phase needs impairment. So what bias we have to take so in between, we are going to have the impairment of your bond markets, your capital markets, as well as your money market also. Okay. Um, looking into, I think this is, I think, relating to the financing part. Am I right, Dr. Navi? How, how, in order to make sure the financial sustainability of a firm. Am I right? This is close to the financial aspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that's, that's the reason I'm trying to say that now we have to find a, a new a new mechanism from the firm's perspective like you were saying just now the capital markets the over dependence on the capital markets will also create a big issue sometimes we are over depending on it so we have to find some other way to 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 do this that's why i'm trying to bring in when you're talking about this i'm trying to bring in this uh this fintech i feel that for me if you ask me i don't know anyway we have our uh, experts from the banking sector i feel uh, we need this fintech on board and come up with a different mechanism, you know, crowdfunding, whatever it is, rather than depending entirely on the banks, on the, you know, on the bonds, on the stocks. Yeah, of course we have to, we still depend, but we have to create the, we have to change the way of raising financing, not only particularly looking into the traditional way of financing, because the, the 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 basically the capital market is not stable at the moment i could see even just now in the morning i was looking into the volatility is very very high for us they drop in march for example stock market but they pick up but they don't pick up so fast it's a very slow pickup so again why because it's a combination of the negatively and positively affected sectors over there so now the firms now we have to find way I know, like for example, number one, they could go for diversification, I would say, at this case. But of course, you can't go in a very immediate case. But you have to find way, another way of financing, raising financing, not from the traditional financing. But for that, we, if you ask me, based on my opinion, the intervention of fintech is very, very crucial. Thank you once again, Dr. Suresh. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, since the intervention of the digital banking, digital financing, and the role of the, the fintech company, that is uh, a way forward. So I'm giving you this, uh, the three strand of discussions uh, for, for your expertise to please address these areas. The one aspect is, what is the future of the fintech in those economies? They are still not uh, very close, uh, having a close adaptability of this, the fintech technology. The second aspect is, at the same time, we have to look into the future of those fintech, the, the corporations, they are facing a very serious the credit losses as well. And finally, so how we can have a flexibility in our regulatory bodies, in our regulatory function, and we can invite a contactless transactions through the use of this, the financial technology. Over to you, Dr. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nabil, and uh, greetings to the smiley face of Dr. Suresh, Dr. Amir, Mr. Sakib, and uh, our respected colleagues and our young participants. So carrying forward the discussion of Dr. Suresh uh, about this pandemic or some sort of lockdown, yes, if cash flows are squeezed, then every company has to face some repayment issues. And ultimately, uh, the eventuality is there, the probability of eventuality is there. 
So right from your question, uh, your first question about uh, fintech and uh, some sort of an assured democracy. So uh, let's divide uh, this question into two parts. We'll have discussion one by one. So first see the significance of financial democracy, how it works and how it is important uh, for our financial order. Economic democracy is, uh, I think uh, we can summarize it as a socioeconomic philosophy that uh, possesses to shift the scene making part from corporate managers and corporate shareholders to a large uh, public shareholder. Uh, and who are the public shareholders? These are workers, these may be customers, these may be suppliers, neighbors, and in broader perspective, these are public. In financial democracy, all the users uh, of financial services, mean you, me, and everyone in this meeting, must have the equal right to take financial advantage rather under certain limitations. For easy understanding, let's have a look on uh, World Bank 2020 initiatives, which were developed actually for equal rights to all financial services users, but what happened till just uh, uh, before a couple, couple of years back. Since 2011, you will be surprised to know that since 2011 to date, 1.2 billion people have opened an account under this great initiative of World Bank 2020. So if 1.2 billion people have opened an account, so what's left? You will be surprised to know that against 1.2 billion open account, Globally, 1.7 billion people or 31% of adults still don't have a basic account. It means two thirds of adults without account site. And the main reason is lack of money. It means financial services don't deserve the low income users. How it's possible if we are discussing financial democracy, if we are discussing digital banking for everyone, mean user equality. So how it's possible that there are some certain limitations for some users and there are some benefits for other users. So as per World Bank Economic Report, there are some other barriers. And these barriers are such like uh, distance from providers or some sort of lack of documentation or some sort of lack of trust in providers and so many other reasons. So where is the financial democracy? That is much, much time needed under new financial order we are discussing uh, just right now. So for understanding in perspective of Pakistan, let's have a look uh, on Pakistan indicators with regard of this great initiative. Under this great initiative in Pakistan, you will be surprised to know the adults transactions accounted for only 13%. And these are 13% against 44% in India. They did well. And if we see the number of undertake, uh, unbanked adults, it's about 107 million. And you will be surprised that may receive digital payments are only 9.5%. So where are the rest percentage? And if you see the received wages or government transfer, it's only 3%. And we see SMEs, uh, Dr. Suresh is also discussing about SMEs. SMEs with outstanding line of credit, you know, it's are only 5%. And women, we are contributing in Pakistan, more than 50% of our population is women. So above 15 years of age, who have saved at financial institutions. You know how much percentage? Their saving percentage is only 1.5%. And women above 15 years of age, you will be surprised to know that, who borrowed from financial institutions in last year is only 0.3%. And the number of ATM for 100,000 adults is only seven. So we can summarize that where we have to and where we are, we can conclude that where we have to reach with, within no time because what is under complete lockdown and there is a dire need of implementing the new financial order. And I, I must say thank you to initiate this great debate of new financial order. And I must suggest this, this can be further uh, extended in many other forums. Now next come to the other concept of uh, FinTech for our uh, young participants and our scholars. This term is generally used uh, to innovations in the financial and technological crossover space. And uh, typically, we can say that the companies or services that use technology and uh, they provide financial services to different businesses or other types of individual customers. 
we know that under fintech transactions are executed through technology and innovation that aims to complete the transactional financial method in the delivery of financial services or some other innovative transaction methodologies fintech is basically uh, we can say it's, it's an emerging industry that uses technology to improve activities in finance uh, let let give me a, a few examples in order to understand more something about uh, uh, the uses of fintech the number one is paypal paypal is a platform for personal and business transactions transfer payments and credit services industry impacts and beyond digital goods and generally if we want to participate in any international conference any event any workshop any symposium we have to pay through paypal because this is a reliable payment transfer method Another example, if you see another success story of fintech, that's Amazon fintech. Amazon fintech investment and acquisitions are light compared to the company's broader portfolio bets. And you will be surprised to know the real facts that globally Amazon has only participated with nine fintech equity investment, and that is worth of 203 million US dollars. And it has made three acquisitions to date. Next, the most important and widely used fintech services is SWIFT. SWIFT is basically the abbreviation of the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications. And it is considered the most reliable source for payment, interbank payments or intrabank payments, intercountry payments or intracountry payments. Whenever you have to receive payment against your imports or whenever you have to pay payment for your exports, always financial institutions offer you a service of SWIFT. If I already explained you the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication. So if you discuss FinTech in banking, the role of FinTech in banking, uh, I will say that FinTech is equipped uh, the banking industry with tools that makes it more efficient than ever before, particularly in the period of this pand uh, pandemic. There are banking institutions uh, using tools like uh, chatbots in order to enhance the customer's experience. They use certain mobile apps, to give customers real-time looks into their bank's accounts and different types of machine learning to secure their against, against any type of fraudulent activities. Uh, I remember uh, way back in 2011, uh, when we were in Malaysia for our, our PhD, we were using CIMB clicks uh, for all inter-interbank transactions in a very secure mode. That was a very secure mode. But you know, this is very unfortunate that still digital banking is not customized in developing and poor countries. So where it should be, it should be digitalized. So for our young generations, our young youth who are doing PhD, there are a lot of way forward. That there are a lot of scope, we can say, that they can start their own startups by using different types of fintech. If you allow me, uh, in next sessions, uh, I will uh, extend uh, these steps, which our young uh, scholars can take in order to develop their own business startups using the uh, fintech methodology. Yes, Dr. Navi. Dr. Amber, thanks for uh, sharing the significance of uh, fintech uh, bridging the flexibility for the uh, the entire financial system. Uh, at the same time, uh, I just want to share with our distinguished panelists. Uh, we have a number of the PhD candidates here on board. Uh, the distinguished faculty from the different campuses of Zabis. Uh, they have a very similar participation. So it would be a good idea that uh, through this uh, global platform, if we could also have our thoughtfulness about some developments in the curriculum, particularly uh, the strengths of the finance and also the areas of the research which are important for our MS graduate and for the PhD graduate. Yeah. So they would be more close to the actual base research. So, so we can add something that is in fact uh, applied research having application for the economic users of the world. So uh, both respectives, Dr. Suresh and Dr. Amber, so we want to listen from you. What recommendations we have uh, regarding the research and the advancement of the curriculum? So let's start with Dr. Suresh. Uh, OK, OK. When it comes to research, it's always me, eh? <laughs> All right, OK. Anyway, um, Looking into at the current scenario, but obviously uh, I would to always emphasize this. When my students come to me, I always tell them that, okay, the topic looks very interesting. 
uh, but uh, the 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 issue is, do you have the data? You see, yeah. But you see, uh, it is very research is a very broad thing. Uh, since all the scholars, uh, PhD students, and the candidates, masters candidates are here, so actually finance is a very interesting uh, subject. And if you look into at the current situation, uh, you can do a lot of research, especially. Uh, looking into uh, event studies because I'm not very sure in terms of uh, a longer period because we need some data to do or to proceed on that. But these kind of event studies are very, really uh, interesting. Looking into uh, specifically on uh, number one, if you see the current situation, as I told you that uh, the uh, sectoral effects, uh, as I told you that negatively and positively affected sectors but you must always remember, even though uh, it is stated that, like, for example, pharmaceutical, if they say it's a positively affected, but don't think that they are entirely positively affected. If you go into more detail in terms of manufacturing pharmaceutical, they are not, they are negatively affected. Retail, they are positively affected. So if you, there, are, there are different scenarios. So this, I would say, uh, a portfolio management uh, pre, during and post uh, pandemic will be a very good uh, research directions. In terms of fintech, fintech, if you see, uh, I think Dr. Am Ahmad is here to help me on that. Um, it is quite developed in the developed countries, but it's not that developed in the emerging. It is, yeah, it is emerging slowly. Am I right? And also it's quite slow, very slow in the developing nations. You know, I think you will agree to me. Uh, but however, if you take, a, take into consideration Malaysia, Malaysia is moving slowly towards that direction. And even now, now recently, they're going to give around uh, five licenses to the uh, challenger bank uh, for certain firms to, to adopt this FinTech um, concept, you know, uh, this mechanism in Malaysia. They're going to sanction five licenses. It's going to uh, be given by the central bank to these companies. So it looks like it's going to pick up slowly. But of course, in terms of uh, data, we don't have a very detailed data. But I think we could start our research from the developed nations. Developed nations, US, UK, they are really, they are really, uh, you know, going very well into it. And look into what happens before uh, this pandemic and during this pandemic. What happens in terms of their performance of the fintech? And uh, most probably uh, end of the year or next year, we can also look into the impact of this COVID-19, the pandemic on this uh, performance of fintech. I'm very sure that it's going to really pick up. When I look into the trend, according to my research on this fintech, they are going to really make use of this pandemic. They, this pandemic is going to assist them. They're going to support them. And uh, I think the banks is going to go behind them. They have to collaborate. I would say, I think the bank has to collaborate with all these fintech companies to, 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 to boost their performance. If not, the banks will be left out. So these are those issues that you can really look into it. And you, you can also look into the performance of the capital markets. It's going to be a little bit different, different settings of the capital markets, you know? And, and, and uh, remember that, uh, again, I would like to emphasize that the developed nation is going to be badly affected. And this is also will also affect the FinTech over there. Uh, so it's like, you know, there are so many areas that we can look into it. So these are the research areas at the moment that we can really look into it. And uh, I would like to attract your attention into the firm's resilience. One of my students from China is doing a PhD and she's looking into this issue, into the firm's resilience, you know? And we know that uh, Wuhan was the first starting point of this COVID, right? And with that is spread like, like no way, you know, it, all over the globe. So um, she's looking into the firm's resilience into that. How do they, uh, picking up on that. So uh, I would like to attract your attention on this uh, firm resilience. You know, these are the important things that I would like to even encourage my students in future. At the moment, I can't because my students are already on track. And also looking into another important thing that is looking into the difference between digitalization, you know, digital and digitized. Digit digitized, yeah. The two different things. We might be thinking that the, the banks are already digitized, but that's the difference between digitized and digital. You know, digital is different than digitized. I think uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Ahmad can help me on that because I could see a very 
a great difference between these two, right? So uh, these are those areas where our finance students can embark on research. Yeah, I think I pass it to Dr. Uh, Ahmad. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, let me clear one thing. First of all, uh, I extend uh, your way that you have told that in developed countries, there are a lot of highly technologically advanced banking systems. Yes, if you see in Pakistan, because this session is being conducted in Pakistan, all big five banks, they have not capability to execute any business transactions via digital systems. This is very unfortunate. Yes. Now, under this pandemic, everyone has to realize that if everybody has to work from home, then we need a systematic technological based financial system through which we can conduct all, we can execute all the transactions, even from our home, even from our offices and uh, even from anywhere so uh, in order to more clarify this concept let me clear first of all the relationship between two financial institutions using the concept of fintech whenever any financial institution for example standard chartered bank standard chartered bank for example standard chartered pakistan has to develop a relationship with hsbc united states so they have to sign a contract that is called rma relationship management application so if two banks have this contract RMA, then any financial transaction executes directly between two banks. But if there is no RMA contract between two banks, then a third bank comes that is called intermediate bank. And in this way, if there is an intermediate bank, then a lot of time is wasted. A lot of money transactional cost is wasted. So, so I propose a centralized institutional network to global RMA arrangement in order to club international financial institutions under certain guarantee so that transfer of payments can be through SWIFT without any intermediate involvement, with minimum charges, without, without any intermediate charges, with equal foreign exchange cost. Uh, I, I'm sure that it will offer equalized digital financial services. And this way, banks can earn through expanded network, rather the helplessness of, helplessness of financial users where one user is enjoying the higher foreign exchange rates, while other users are bearing the lower forex, uh, foreign exchange rates. And that is just due to unequal treatment by the financial institutions uh, in absence of R RMA arrangement. Uh, if we discuss about uh, some potential topics, what I'm conducting uh, research postgraduate research from my students, uh, I would extend a few topics uh, that is very, uh, very potential and uh, our students in Zebes, uh, they can pursue these topics that our financial institutions in Pakistan or any other region can pursue a digital business strategy. Simultaneously, how digital business convergence and uh, emerging contested fields uh, can extend under, under the pandemic, any pandemic situation. Then digital business leadership is another uh, potential topic that how leadership can perform through uh, digitalization of the businesses in financial sector as well as in non-financial sector. Then along with digital business leadership, digital marketing, and service industry. So everything is going digitalized. So there are a lot of topics. Then advantages of documented economy, the financial democracy for equal user independence, then critical success factors for digital business strategies, then fintech and disruptive business models in different financial products, or ecosystem. Ecosystem is another very important topic. And blockchain. You remember that blockchain is legalized in many countries. They have proper ATM machines, all the multinational corporations like Toyota, Mitsubishi, and many other companies, they properly accept blockchain uh, money transfers. So there are a lot of potential topics under this pandemic or under new financial uh, uh, world order, uh, for Dr. Naveed's recommendation. Uh, there are a lot of potential topics we can extend to our students that they, they should pursue these financial topics. Yes, over to Dr. Naveed. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, uh, I was just looking into the significance of the areas. Uh, we have already uh, very insightful thoughts about uh, the governance aspect. Then we have invited insights about the role of the, the fintech in creating the flexibility. And finally, we have a discourse about what is the new theme of the, the curriculum development and the research recommendations we have. But at the same time, when we look into the entire orbit, so the, uh, we also have to look into the fiscal space as well. So this is one of the idea. I was just looking into the international financial sustainability reports 
they have recently been issued by IMF. So we could find, in case of the advanced settings, even we could experience the economies, they have contributed more than 9% of their GDP as a social stimulus fiscal packages for their economies. But we look into the cases entirely different in case of developing economies, in case of the emerging economies, where there is the issue of the purchasing parity. We could also experience there is the issue of sluggish economic growth is taking place and also the level of confidence of the invest, uh, investor that is already very shaking. So from that perspective, it would be very insightful if we could have our thoughtfulness also on how we can create the fiscal space of for the economies in the emerging area and also in the the developing side of the world. So over to Dr. Suresh first. So uh, basically you're asking about the, um, because the, the line from my side is not very clear, uh, Dr. Navi. So I couldn't grab the question uh, correctly. My line is not very clear. Uh, can Suresh. you just make it? Yeah, uh, can just can you hear, summarize. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? No, it's not very, it's like uh, there's some distortions. Okay, in the meanwhile, uh, I give you uh, this thought in writing uh, so we can engage discussion firstly from Dr. Amber. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, send me, send me. I, I can't hear well, yeah. Okay, okay, I share you in the writing. Uh, Dr. Amber, yeah. uh, how, we, how we can create a fiscal space in emerging and developing economies uh, where is the serious e uh, economic crunch uh, that, uh, that is already taking place? Yeah. Uh, if you remember that, uh, unfortunately, there are many countries uh, since many, many decades, since two or three decades, they are facing some sort of equity of uh, 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 some sanctions. And these sanctions are very critical for the public, not for the government. Whenever FATF imposes some sort of sanctions, so the exports of the countries are disturbed, and imports of the countries are disturbed, then all the economic activities of the countries are disturbed. So under the recommendations, 40 recommendations of FATF, the first one is digitalization of the financial transactions. So digitalization of financial transactions is, is not an easy task. Because if you see the list of all the sanctioned countries, almost 90% countries are belong to either poor or some sort of underdeveloping countries. So they are always lack of resources. They are already poor, but the purchase of such type of digital financial system, because in one financial uh, institution, if you want to uh, uh, implement one latest software, you will be surprised that they need billions of rupees, billions of rupees to implement one system. So it's not an easy task. So I, I recommend, I have already recommended to FATF that we should consider this, that if countries are already poor, how they can increase their technologically advanced systems in the financial institution. We should support them if we want to take them out from the sanctions. So this is the responsibility of FATF and all developed nations, that they should provide some technology, some uh, you can say discount based technology so that they, their system, their banking system can be improved technology wise improved but unfortunately for the last two decades i'm seeing that the list of all the sanctioned countries they belong to either poor countries or some sort of developing country so if they are already poor countries they are already under developing countries so this is very very difficult for them to implement all the uh, technologically advanced system in their financial institutions and ultimately their public is suffer so this this gap should be removed this gap should be removed because States are not suffered. So communities, public is suffered. So that's why this gap should be involved. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Dr. Swain, uh, Dr. Suresh, uh, I'm audible to you now. Uh, I just shared my uh, the text message with, uh, with you as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I, now, now I can hear. I can hear a little bit. Yeah, um, because I'm very sorry. The line is quite bad at this time. I don't know why. Uh, uh, yeah, um, from my side, I don't know what uh, Dr. Ahmad said, but uh, looking into um, uh, some sort of like how we're going to solve these issues. Huh? So basically, uh, uh, what I can actually uh, propose here is that you see. 
um, we know that it's, it's like we have three different types of countries. One is developed, developing, and uh, in also the emerging. But what was the beauty part is that this pandemic has basically pushed everyone for those who don't have a smartphone to acquire a smartphone at the end of the day. You see, so they now they realize that the importance of this digitalization. So that's the first thing. So if let's say, you know, like we, we, we know that we have rich countries, we have an average country, we have poor countries. Uh, getting into this digitalization is not an easy. It is not to say it's not that easy process because it deals with a few factors. For example, you need infrastructure, you need uh, capitals, you know, and you need experts on that. You know, and, and the most important is the awareness, awareness among the community, the society itself. Because if they are not ready to use that, then there's no point for the banks, for example, to come up with this. But however, I think the we are almost globalized. So we are quite aware of what is going on around the world. So basically what we can do is that I would like to propose that um, the country basically has to uh, for me, I would like to look into uh, the credit policy. You know, uh, one is of course digitalized. You know, on digitalizations. Okay, so I would like to say that let's go on on let's accelerate. I like to use the word accelerate. Okay, looking into the the future, let's accelerate the digitization. Okay, not digitized, but it has to be digital. We are not encouraging the banks or you know, everyone to use online beyond that okay okay then you must have these smart lending capabilities and it, it will just around the globe you know so it will also help those from investors from a poor country to get all these kind of connect you know um facilities so uh it, it i would like to say the smart lending capabilities will allow, will allow banks to make greater use of online technology to originate loans okay and this will actually will, will actually encourage and also improve the economy, uh, regardless which country. For example, it's very clear at the moment, you know, for example, the international trade is badly affected. Don't be surprised, you're going to see a huge impact on the fixed, I'm uh, sorry, the exchange rates. And this is going to affect them. So we would like to find another mechanism. And I felt that's the first thing that we have to find out a best way that is acceleration of digitizations and it's, that is leads to smart lending capabilities. That's the only way, not the only way, one of the way to boost, uh, to boost um, the economy. I would like to propose also to, I mean, uh, of course, just to propose, you know, if the government or even the banking sector could look to revisit by the credit policy or come up or try to establish COVID-19 credit policy, for example need to be established in each and every country to look into the, the, the situation of each country, you know? So that will really, you know, really help them. Because at the current situation, with this uh, traditional banking, I don't think so, is going to improve. And I'm very sure we're going to see a lot of bankruptcy. Uh, what I want, based on my reading, even in US itself, they are, they are expecting this. A lot of high bankruptcy uh, rate, you know? So why? Because the, the, the firms, no matter the big can survive for a short term, but the small could not survive. So we hope that through this acceleration of digitalization and smart lending, I would propose this as one of the mechanism to, to, to solve, uh, you know, or to, to overcome the situation of this pandemic at this moment. Yeah. yeah so the dear panel, uh, let me, uh, if you allow me, uh, let me add something. Yes, please. Dr. Suresh. Uh, along with digital world, digital banking system or technologically advancement in case of any pandemic or whatever the situation we are facing. Uh, the most important thing is security because yeah. if any financial institution is improving its technology and there is no security, then everything will be on stake. I just remember two days back I received an email from Academy of Management USA because there is a conference in Canada in August. Maybe it will be postponed due to pandemic. <laughs> The state formally requested all the participants, more than 12,000 participants, that our system has been hacked. So this is a big problem. That if you are going to do digitalization, then you have to improve your security because billions of dollars, billions of rupees are in the system. So if any person who has some good command on the system, they can break anything anytime. 
And yeah. you remember in Pakistan, in many other countries, we have always listened that some sort of accounts data have been stored. So the security is the main thing that if your servers are in the hands of somebody else, then how you can secure the security? So it's a very important point that, that is raised by Dr. 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 Suresh that under this pandemic, it's not possible that there should be queues outside the banks. There are queues inside the banks. We have to remove these queues. We have to safely uh, uh, transfer the services, financial services at home, at offices, to all the public, all the consumers, all the uh, industries. But at the same time, all the services, all the financial services, all the credit services, it should be very secure. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, exactly. Uh, I agree with Dr. Hamad. Actually, uh, that I, I didn't uh, include that about the cyber security. I yeah. think Dr. Hamad is trying. Yeah, Dr. Hamad is trying to emphasize that. That is definitely. That is definitely because uh, you know hackers are being the king in the market now. You know they can just hack things easily. Even even working from home from the bank. That's another challenge for the banking sector now. You know if you want to ask them to work from home, those your you know your your offices from home. This is another big issue because you know this is becoming a very big issue even in malaysia you don't have to talk about other countries even here we are experiencing that you know a lot of scams and all these things coming in and you know uh, and these guys are really making up they're grabbing this opportunity during this time and this is another big risk where you know uh, but i what i felt that yeah of course we're looking into that perspective that is the bank perspective they have to look but i think in terms of the fintech Sometimes they're quite, in terms of security, they're quite good. Am I right, Dr. Ahmad? I think in terms, yeah. they always cater for that. The, yeah. the, 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 the security, the cyber security is quite strong on the other side of the fintech. That actually attract those, uh, you know, uh, customers to do transactions uh, via fintechs, you know? So I felt that uh, then obviously the bank has to try to adopt that, that level of cyber security to make sure that uh, basically, you know, they can maintain the demand. That that's the only thing. So the cyber security plays a very major role. Actually, you are right. Okay, the dear panelists, uh, I just want to share with you that we have uh, the very active role of the, the distinguished finance faculty. They're also on board, and we have a PhD uh, graduates. Uh, their specialization of the finance areas they are pertinent to the systemic risk. So it would be worth listening if. Uh, finance faculty and particularly the PhD candidates of Zebis, they want to participate because we are going through this systemic risk and we have this spill, uh, spillover impact. So it would be a good insight if we want to listen from our scholars and particularly from the faculty of finance, even the few faculty, they have the publications in the FinTech as well. So yeah, yeah, any, distinct, yeah, any distinguished faculty member or any PhD candidate, if you want to participate. Yeah, please, please share your, your opinions. We are, we are here, we are ready to hear. We are happy to hear that. Sir, uh, I, would, uh, I would like to add something. Yeah, sure. Yes, yes please. Um, uh, Dr. Suresh has uh, rightly pointed out uh, that uh, it is the high time that uh, banks should come forward and they should accelerate the digitization and uh, they should opt for the smart uh, smart lending processes uh, if we if we look at the banking sector uh, it is it is uh, uh, among different uh, even developing economies uh, it is uh, earning a lot uh, from the economy and uh, it is the time uh, now it is the time for the banking industry to give back something uh, to the economy from which they are earning uh, uh, when they when they when they see the opportunities in the market they started the uh, islamic banking windows they started the insurance windows now it is the time to start the smart lending windows now it is the time to start the microfinance windows so that the small businesses the proprietorships uh, partnerships and uh, small companies uh, can get the subsidized loan and they can survive through this uh, difficult times and it will really help to uh, for uh, the overall growth of the economy and at the end of the day it will give benefit to the banking sector banking sector will earn from these uh, customers to whom he would be uh, the banking sector would be supporting and uh, uh, just, just a note uh, dear participants uh, please just briefly introduce yourself uh, before you are going to share your views so my name is Hassan Hanif and i'm a phd candidate 
Uh, I would like to continue from where the uh, Sultan has left that it is now a major task for banks to play their part in stabilizing the economic situation as soon as possible. To be able to do this, however, they must first and foremost be able to provide companies with necessary support promptly and to ensure their survival. The application for loan development from countless small and medium-sized businesses should be processed quickly. As we can uh, see that the, a lot of, there are a lot of job, jobs layoff uh, and the, it is very, becoming very difficult for the businesses to survive. So the banks need to play their active role in that. But along with that, we also need to look at uh, the challenges that are being coped by the banks or the challenges that are being faced by the banks. It is very difficult. The COVID-19 has made the uh, situation very difficult for the banks. It is very difficult for them to meet their administrative costs and etc. So we have to look at that from both the aspects. And the situation is dynamic and uh, the consistently evolving policies uh, should be introduced to cope with that challenge. Thank you, sir. Let me clarify something. The first uh, student who raised a question that banking sector should come forward to meet these challenges. Uh, our young generation, you, you must understand the lending is based on the cost of capital. If any financial institution's cost of capital is low, it will be able to provide credit on lower rate. But if any financial institution's cost of capital is high, they can never lend on lower rate because their cost of capital is higher. Number two, you're saying that uh, banks should go for uh, online credits, some sort of online credit. It's, it's possible for just like personal loans or very small so, sort of loans, but when we will discuss it with medium enterprises or corporate enterprises, then all financial institutions have to take measure and they have to filter all the credits through five credits. Five credits mean characters, then capital, then credit worthiness, then cash flows, and finally collateral. So in this way, the possibility of online credit lending is possible by way of some small loans, some micro loans, some microfinance loans, but it's not possible for corporate loans or some sort of medium loans. But uh, as, I, as I informed to you that it's government, it's state. If they allow the central bank to provide some sort of uh, products to financial institutions on subsidized rates in order to lend towards small businesses or medium businesses or some discount rates. So the money will not come from banks. The money will come from state because that will be a discounted rate and that rate will be offered by the government, not the financial institutions because financial institutions are profit making organizations. They cannot be a loss. If any financial institution's cost of capital is 8%, they can never lend less than 8%. So in, finance, in, state bank of, in state bank of any country, like in Pakistan, they are offering so many products to exporters on very discounted rates in order to improve the export of the country. So same like due to this COVID-19, they have started to different companies, they have started their products for salaries. And for those purposes, they are offering credit, small credits to all, all uh, industries in Pakistan on some discount rates, I mean 2% or 3% so that they can extend these loans to, to different industries and they can extend their salaries to their employees. Even they are working from home or even they are not working, the companies are closed. So less than cost of capital is not possible for the banks. It's state that can provide these type of discounted loans. Thanks, thanks. Uh, this clarification was necessary. Yeah. This is, so yeah, yeah, this is basically, you know, when, when uh, Dr. Amas talks about this, uh, when you talk about the cost of capital, yeah, this is where this uh, the concept of financial inclusions comes into the picture. Yeah, yeah I do agree that sometimes, uh, even though you can't be just, you know, uh, it's not that easy because end of the day, there is a risk behind that for the banks, right? So uh, the central bank has to play a major role in this case to look into this uh, system, how to create this uh, financial inclusion. Inclusion is basically... You have to make sure uh, you come up with the financial products and services which is accessible and affordable. At the end of the day, um, the cost has to be low. Then the firms can survive. I'm talking about the firms who get the loans, for example. So here, the government through the central bank has to, you know, has to come up and uh, they have to come up with certain mechanism. They have to like I think like in Malaysia, uh, we are basically the government is injecting in the SMEs, for example. You see. Yeah, so these are those examples where the government has to intervene. If not, 
uh, we can't change the situation. But another issue is that, uh, again, when you say that, yeah, we are talking about digitization, that the bank has to, uh, you know, uh, transform themselves into or collaborate with the fintechs or using the fintechs mechanism or the system. But again, another issue is uh, the awareness. The awareness is another important thing. We have to look into the awareness of the society. Are they aware about this, first of all? Sometimes they feel so insecure. For them, they're so convenient with the banking system to queue up, you know, to get all these forms fill up and to see face to face. And suddenly everything is online. So they feel so insecure. Shall I invest? Shall I do that? So all these things come to this is like quite common, especially in the emerging and developing market. So that is another challenge, actually. OK, I give back to, to, the, to, to the rest of the uh, scholars. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, one important advice uh, to our young generation, because for business purposes, it's a different perspective. But for individuals, they always save their passwords, their logins within within their mobiles, uh, in Notepad or some other things. But whenever you go to install any application, they always seek permission. That please access us to your photos, your documents, your everything. So that is the main source for stealing of your password. So I suggest you. For an, as an individual investor, never save your any login or password in your mobiles. This is one suggestion for you. Yeah, correct, hundred percent correct. I agree to that. Okay. Uh, okay, the dear panelist, uh, consistent with our this thoughtfulness, uh, for a safe lending, uh, we uh, also need to have a very close look how we are going to deal this the wave of bankruptcies. So it's a very technical uh, it, uh, it's a very technical issue in fact if we look into the bankruptcy code of conduct across the world we could find one way forward is once the firm is going through the bankruptcy they can go for the recapitalization the rehabilitation of that firm is possible and we can give it a name uh, the reorganization as well that is a chapter 11 according to the bankruptcy law so at the same time we could find the, the other way forward, that is the liquidation process is there. Now the dichotomy is there in this process. If we look into particularly the developing economies, including Pakistan, in case of Pakistan, the scope of bankruptcy law that is just looking into the liquidation. Once the firm is going to have a declaration that we are bankrupt, so then they cannot go for the recapitalization. So it, it would be one of the area that we have to address. So I would invite the thoughtfulness of the, the panel. So how we are going to have a safe landing. So before we are going to have in a further crunch, we can address this issue of the recapitalization of the firm. This is important. And the recapitalization of the market also. Yeah. Uh, if you allow me, uh, I would suggest yep. that uh, in financial institutions, whenever they face some sort of eventuality, some sort of uh, liquidity of any uh, firm, this is unfortunate that developing and poor nations, they don't have so much resources to support any sick unit. When any company file their chapter 11, this is unfortunate fact that a statement of any country or the state of any country, they never come forward to support that sick unit. They always go through the liquidation process through court and it will take long time to liquidate the fixed assets and current assets and sale of the current assets and the payment of uh, uh, the proceeds towards the adjustment of financial institutions loans and some sort of supplies payments. But there should be, yes, uh, a suggestion is very good. There should be a remedy that whenever any organizations uh, face some sort of liquidity issues, there should be some strategy from Central Bank of any country, particularly in Pakistan, we are discussing about Pakistan. There should be a strategy that if the intention is not bad, the capacity is bad, then state bank or central bank must put forward and they should feed some uh, some money in order to improve the capacity. But if the intention is bad, capacity is there, but intention is bad, then of course, there is no, uh, there is no support. So yes, Dr. Suresh. Yeah, looking into the bankruptcy issue, I think um, uh, from the Malaysia perspective, um, if I go back to 97, 98 Asian financial crisis, it was a good lesson where we can see all the, not the large firms, but basically the small and the medium firms where they were, they just disappeared from the markets because it was a big hike up. You know, it's a big increase in the interest rates and 
And, and they will all move on the short-term loans. You know, that's another problem at the moment. But I think there's, there's, there's some diversion took place in, in, you know, there's a shift in Malaysia where they started to look into long-term financing. I still remember, you know, we, we would see when I was doing my PhD, I could see that Malaysia was moved towards short-term. This is, this is the main reason sometimes we couldn't handle that. They will just leave, you know, they will just go bankrupt. So here, uh, what is the thing is that uh, there are a few things we have to revisit back. That is looking into, even though we say that we have learned lesson, we are quite resilient. But again, uh, this is only applicable for the large firm, not for the medium and small firms. What I mean, not the small SMEs, but even normal firms. Sometimes they are quite small compared to large firms. So these kind of firms, actually, they need some assistance. And I feel that the, the government intervention is very important at this stage. Because obviously what through central banks, what they can do, they can basically reduce, you know, the minimum requirement of the reserve. The, 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 the central bank can do that, you know, whereby, uh, you know, so uh, encouraging the banks uh, to give loans at a lower rate, uh, you know, because if not, it's going to be really difficult. So we need all this uh, from the government. It should start from the government, basically, because from the government intervention through the bank, central bank or for Malaysia, Bank Nagara, Malaysia, Central Bank of Malaysia. So they could actually intervene into this and try to actually reduce this, this bankruptcy. But by in mind, it's going to be really a critical situation where the bankruptcy rate is anticipated to, to be increased, especially for those firms which is highly leveraged, they will be facing a very huge problem because it's, it's very clear cut because at the moment, if, if there is no economy activity going on and they, they won't be getting revenue and they could not pay the interest. And uh, we can't be expecting the bank to reduce further and further without the assistance of the government. So here, I think the government has to play a very major big role in, in, you know, in accelerating and to facilitate this situation. If not, I'm very sure it's going to be a big issue, even in Malaysia itself. Yeah, we yeah, agree. In Oman, if you discuss the experience in Oman, for start of any business from any startup, they always provide interest-free loan to the business enterprises, interest-free loan. But whenever any company faces some sort of liquidity issues, always government come forward in order to support them financially so that they can avoid from any eventuality. But this is possible because the economy of Oman is too strong. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there, yeah, discussion is there that if any country is in a position to support their sick units, their default units, then they should come forward. But otherwise, it's, it's not possible in developing or poor countries. Okay, the yeah. distinguished, uh, distinguished panelist, uh, the significance of the time uh, that is uh, we call the time value of money. So, looking into the sequence of the program that Sorry. we have. Now it warrants the need uh, that we should have a line of defense. Uh, this, uh, Mr. Muhammad Ali, you want to add something? No, sir. Please carry on. I just mistakenly got my mic on. Okay, it's okay. Sir. Thank you. So, looking into the significance of that, uh, the time. So now, uh, the time to to move forward with a strong recommendation. I would say, and the firstly, we have to start with. What should be the line of action if we are going to have a, to establish a packing order? So what should be the three line of action? So I would also engage uh, the worthy dean of faculty uh, in this closing discussion. So we should uh, finally have a takeaway in the form of the line of defense that we are going to offer uh, for the sustainability of the uh, the entire economic and the financial system of the world. So at the same time, it also becomes important. We should have a certain recommendations in the form of that is implications we can offer to the policy makers uh, of the different economy. So the firstly, I would start with Dr. Suresh. So sir, any two key recommendations from your side? Um, recommendation from my side is um, I'm emphasizing on the supply of credit to the economy, uh, which I feel is quite important in, in, in order to make sure, you know, to preserve the resilience of the global financial system. That's why I was referring to that uh, in terms of the supply of credit and strengthening the resilience through operational readiness and contingency planning of financial institutions is very important and um, digitization with proper uh, cyber security arrangement will actually make things better and uh, yeah i think this is the main thing i would i would propose and finally the most important protecting the health and the safety of the staffs and consumer customers that's very that's the fundamental actually 
to make sure everything goes. And uh, Dr. Suresh, along with uh, your recommendations, I just want to give uh, a gentle reminder uh, that we uh, we have a potential dialogue with you regarding uh, the collaboration of research and knowledge exchange programs. So I think it's a good opportunity. Uh, we can also think about very seriously because this uh, digital landscape already been provided that opportunity. So we can uh, exchange our research. We can be a strategic uh, research partners in the future as well. So uh, we already have uh, the MOU with you. So the yeah, salient yeah. features, we already have uh, the modalities being decided. Just uh, a waiting side is that is the signing of the ceremony. Uh, yeah, actually, I'm very sorry to Assistant Professor Dr. Navid. He already passed me for some time. But when, when we were started, we already submitted to our office. And when we were supposed to embark into it, the MCO came in and everything was stopped. But anyway, it's already is, is in the pro process. Uh, I hope so. We will do a very good collaborations uh, with your university in terms of research and also in publications, right? We can do, we can embark more on that. Definitely. Uh, for information, we have like seven research group in our faculty with uh, various uh, experts. And one of the research group is specifically focusing on finance. So we can do a lot of uh, uh, collaborative uh, publications, you know, and via UTM is actually focusing only on the index ISR papers and also, you know, high impact paper. So we could actually work on that. There's no uh, issue. We will do that, definitely. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, Dr. Amos, please. Yeah, uh, in first recommendation, I would extend the World Bank 2020 initiatives that clearly states that still 31% of adults are out of basic account. And the reasons they have mentioned, they have low income, the reasons they have mentioned distance from provider, the reasons they have, meant, uh, they have mentioned lack of documentation need, and trust in providers. So my first recommendation that under new financial order, digital financial services must be equally accessible for every person beyond income, beyond gender, beyond nationality, beyond geography. It will offer financial democracy. And my second recommendation that bilateral trade means trade between two countries. One is important and one is exported. It must be in a currency, either country or commodity, whatever is suitable for both countries rather dependency on a single dominant currency. This is very important. And why I'm giving this suggestion in order to free it from any monopolistic influence. It will offer strength to local currencies and financial independence rather than monopolistic influence of a third country, uh, third currency. So these are my two recommendations. And the first one recommendation I already given that there should be a centralized institutional network to global RMA arrangement in order to club international financial institutions under certain guarantees so that transfer of payments can be swift without any intermediate involvement with minimum charges mean without any intermediate charges or with equal foreign exchange cost. It will definitely offer equalized digital financial services and uh, this way banks can earn through their expanded network not that the, uh, not that the helpless of financial, financial users where one user is you have higher rates and the other using is, is, is bearing the lower foreign exchange rates. This way, uh, I just uh, I feel that uh, the unequal treatment of uh, uh, financial institutions to the users will be eradicated. So these are my three recommendations. Okay, uh, the thank you, Dr. Ahmed and uh, Dr. Suresh. Uh, the sem very seminal thoughtfulness that has been exchanged, and the recommendations uh, they are well taken uh, since. Uh, it's uh, the time uh, to think about uh, the closure of the event and for this I would request once again uh, to the worthy dean of faculty but please extend your words of the thanks along with uh, a thoughtfulness that would be uh, the opening for uh, the new series of the events that we are going to place. So over to you Dr. Shamsi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Navid, and I am very, very thankful to our worthy panelists, Dr. Suresh and Dr. Ahmed. Uh, for a very uh, thoughtful discussion and generally you people covered almost uh, every aspect broadly speaking of the financial sector including from individuals to the government level to central bank uh, digitalization cyber security and uh, importantly as Dr. Strange that uh, said that uh, learning lessons uh, one of the most important aspect of humanity we are supposed to learn from our experiences uh, as Shakespeare said 
wise learn from others experiences and stupids learn from the, their own experiences and what we can say when we even do not learn from our own experiences so we are even worse than stupids uh, but he has we have to learn from our experience <laughs> Uh, very rightly said. I think. I think the the most important element I take away is learn from uh, lessons, and learning lessons should always be there. And uh, COVID nineteen is a big, big avenue of learning lessons. And the things, the aspects uh, uh, are emerging is digitalization and the cyber security and cyber legislation. And this is important, as Dr. Ahmed says, because we have to broaden. The uh, bank nations, and without digitalization and cyber and security, cyber legislation and security, we cannot do this. This would be a dream, and to transform this dream into a reality, we have to work very uh, on war footings and rigorously to achieve these things. Um, and uh, uh, supply of credit, the last um, uh, two points were. Dr. Sray said the supply of credit is important and it is very important in these terms because many organizations are becoming sick because of this COVID-19 and government and central banks should come up and there is no way out. I agree with him. There is no way out uh, other than government and central bank to come up and support the system as Dr. Emma said the example of Oman of his startups and for sick units no matter Government is rich or not, but this is their responsibility and this is their ethical responsibility to come up. So it's not the matter of richness, it's the matter of supporting each other. So they have to develop a system. A system should be that if a poor government is there, they should come up with some credit so that sick units can stand on their feet. And uh, as rightly said, Dr. Suresh, digitalization with cyber security is must. And the important part, along with digitalization and financial security, what Dr. Ahmed also said is trade between the countries. It's not uh, to avoid the, the supremacy of big countries. Two countries, more or less, with, I mean, difference of in uh, of richness but if two countries like Malaysia and Oman Malaysia and Pakistan Pakistan and Oman if they extend their business so they would be better off so I mean it's, it's, it's a good lesson learned from uh, from this discussion uh, so I'm really really very thankful uh, to my worthy panelist and uh, and the last uh, I must extend my thanks to all my guests and audience for sparing time. I'm seeing around 33, 34, 36 participants have been, some people uh, discontinued, but they re rejoined. So I'm really very thankful to all participants for sparing time. This has been a very good learning session and we are in a position at the end of the day and very good recommendations are coming from our panelists. May Allah bless you for your contribution, uh, Dr. Amma, Dr. Suresh, uh, as a teacher, because I believe teachers are respected by God and those who are respected by God, we are bound to respect them. So thank you very much, sir. Uh, for helping out and giving your contribution. At the end, I must appreciate the managing committee of this event, uh, University of Technology Malaysia, because you are representative of Suresh, so I must thank the university as well and university. So Hara University, Uman and Dr. Ahmad, you are representative. So not only thanks to you in individual capacity, but your universities as well. And along with this, the leadership of Zabas Islamabad campus, uh, I must name because I know them. Um, Mr. Khusro Parve Sahab, Dr. Asif Khan Sahab, Dr. Naveed Sahab and many other who engaged in arranging such wonderful and I tell you very honestly I learned from this session thank you very much for teaching me as well uh, and all those who participate in and make this event a success thanks to all of them once again and Allah Hafiz from my side that's okay, all from uh, my side. okay Dr. Shamsi once again thank you so much uh, the bigger voice we have taken from you that is ultimately the humanity uh, because the, I, I would say this is a time to pay back. So the lesson learned, uh, it's, it, uh, the life order is changed. So we have to think about from the bigger thoughts of the humanity also. 
So once again, I want to extend my words of uh, thanks, my words of the thoughtfulness to all the participants. Uh, I can uh, imagine it was uh, the public holiday in Pakistan. Irrespective of your engagements, uh, you are sparing your time for this thoughtfulness. So once again, a sheer appreciation by thoughts uh, for every one of you. Uh, Dr. Asif uh, is also around uh, as a good observer uh, throughout this event. Dr. Asif, thank you so much uh, for providing always a very enabling environment. So where the things they happen actually. Thank you so much. Uh, live safe, uh, but live at a social distance. Take care. Allah. Thank you. God bless you. Allah Hafiz. Thank you, everyone. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz. Thank you, everyone.